if you would, to John 6. John 6. How many of you all know who the, what the Lord of the Rings? You ever heard of that? Lord of the Rings? When I was in college, my brother was reading the Lord of the Rings. And uh, I was not a reader of much of anything at the time. And he, he told me that the guy who wrote this had created full languages to create this world. And as a non-reader or token reader at the time, I thought, why in the world would you take that much time to make languages for a fake world that's not even real? Why would you do that? I know, I know why now. Tolkien believed that we create because we were made by a creative maker. So as image bearers, he thought that it's perfectly natural to create. And so what he did was he made this imaginative world, what he calls sub-creation, that was intended for people to go and read and to consider and kind of feel this other world. And here's why. He found in fairy stories for himself that the wonder of things returned to him. He says, and it was in fairy stories that I first divined, which means saw, the potency of words, the wonder of things, listen to this, such as stone and wood and iron tree and grass, house and fire, bread and wine. The wonder of wood, the wonder of grass, the wonder of iron, the wonder of trees. He thought fairy stories could make you see your real world better by entering there, kind of pausing from the normal. You entered this sub-creation, what he called, as an image bearer, he made it, but entering this place that has his own history, he found when you left, having read these things, you'd come and look at your own world and see things like wood. Have you ever thought how crazy wood is? Have you ever thought how amazing a leaf is? Have you ever thought that you're breathing air right now, that your heart is beating right now, that you have relationships with real people, that there is a Savior who entered our, time, our history to save us? That's why he wrote Lord of the Rings. Well, some of it. And he was an artist. But th that was his deal. He really thought you could see your own world better by doing this. That helps me to see our world a little bit. The same king who authored our world and faithfully upholds its laws day after day still causes people today to trust him. The same king who authored. Really, our world is a created world. It is an authored world. It didn't have to be this way. He chose to make it this way. He created this world. It's a broken world, right? There's rebellion in this world. And yet he spoke it into existence. This same author, he continues to uphold these laws that we just assume. Of course, when I get up, the sun's going to be there. Of course, I'm going to be able to breathe. Of course, the sky is like that. Nah, it was made. Look with you with me at verse, uh, John verses one, excuse me, John six verses one through five. Stand in honor of God's word with me. If you would. John 6, what has just happened is Jesus healed a man who had been uh, crippled for about 38 years, and he starts to make claims that he's God. This is another glimpse of one of John's signs uh, that continues to testify to this, that Jesus is, is the Messiah, this promised one, and his intent is so that we would believe, not just have trivia. Look verses 1 through 5. After this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs and he was doing, that he was doing on, on the sick. He just went up on the mountainside and there he, was, he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. Lifting up his eyes then and seeing that a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? Pray with me. Now, Lord, I pray that you'd help us to see things that we're used to seeing. Or Tolkien's right, that we need to see again. These promises, the reality of our world, better. So, Father, help us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. First thing to note, he, he goes across the Sea of Galilee, and thousands of feet are now following him because he was healing the sick. Have you all seen The Chosen? Anyone see The Chosen? It's a pretty interesting... He does a good job of kind of showing um, this growing movement in the, in the wilderness it's kind of this helpful view, but the deal is at this point in time, thousands of feet are starting to follow him. I remember going to Honduras uh, for a medical uh, clinic, and the, the possibility to have medical help 
in Honduras, where we were, was a neat opportunity and a privilege. They didn't have great medical technology, and people were coming in droves to be able to be helped. Uh, that that kind of air is what's going on around Jesus. He's healing people, and, and it's a time when you know, it's not like medical uh, technology existed at this time, and they're coming to him because they, they long for hope. It says he went up, they went up on the mountainside and sat with his disciples. This reoccurring picture of Jesus shaping these people who were following him. And verse 4 says that Passover is at hand. Passover is at hand. Remember, this is the celebration of God's deliverance from slavery with the servant Moses. An impossible deliverance is kind of this air. And for me, when I think of like the air of a season, I think of Christmas. You know, I don't know if you're like that. Maybe it's not like that. Some people, if Christmas isn't their background, Christmas means like, you know, that's neat. Uh, but for me, <laughs> in my world, Christmas is a season. It starts, you know, Starbucks begins in uh, Thanksgiving and it runs it all the way through. Sorry, Jimmy. Uh, but, but the deal is, that doesn't really matter. I mean, it, obviously, it's been misapplied and taken advantage of. But there's an heir to Christmas, this coming time of remembering the incarnation is what we get to do. Sometimes we don't do that well. But the Passover is at hand. And it says, Jesus looks and he sees a large crowd coming toward him. Large crowd coming toward him. Another story. When I lived in Colombia, we went to this place called the Guajira, which was kind of like wilderness. And I remember we were driving to this place and all these people were going to meet us. And I mean, no one was around, nothing was around. It's like driving to the middle of a desert. And people are like, no, they're going to be there. And you're thinking, where? There, there is nothing. <laughs> there is nothing. Who is coming? Where are we going? <laughs> it's just the wilderness. And then just people would just walk. You couldn't even see. I'm like, I don't even know how they got the word out. I have no idea. But a bunch of people came. It wasn't thousands, but it was 50s. I don't know, maybe 100. I was a kid, so you know how you don't see numbers. You just kind of see there. A bunch of people. But I remember thinking... What people? Where are we? Well, thousands of people have come out to Jesus. They know He can do these kind of amazing things. And then they're approaching in this kind of distant place. He tells Philip, where are you going to buy bread for these people? And in the Guajita, if Jesus had told me that, I think I would have been a bit like Philip. What are you talking about? There is nothing is here. There is nothing here. And that's what he basically says. But the Bible says that he's actually testing Philip. Philip is a realist. Very practical. It is obviously the case that we can do nothing about this. Look at verse 5. Lifting up his eyes, seeing this large crowd coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy the bread so these people may eat? And he said this to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. In verse 7, Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread would not even be enough for each of them to have a little. Thousands of people are with him. We'll see later, at least 5,000 men, and it may be closer to 10,000 people, and upwards of that, by the way. A lot of people. Nothing to provide as far as Philip is concerned. You've got to be kidding me. Now, have you ever cooked for, say, 500 people? Me either. I've seen a couple hundred. I've seen 300. Uh, but but 10,000, that's another world. That's an impossible world. And that's where this is. You need to see that real dependence is part of the soil of faith. He purposely let them go, this is impossible. And they knew it was impossible. Real dependence is part of the soil of faith. Faith grows with resistance. I've said that before, but I never like it. I like to be in control. I like to have all the answers. And God is perfectly comfortable. He was comfortable in this situation. He was comfortable in many situations before with my dependence. Pressure and dependence reveal our hearts. God tests Philip's heart, not because he wonders what Philip is going to do, but because Philip needs to know who he is. But here's the key thing. This is not new for God's people. Think about uh, the Exodus. Think about the Passover that has happened in the past. There was this daily dependence that ultimately they needed. Manna was something God had to provide. And what God did was he, he made them depend daily. They couldn't stockpile manna. In the wilderness, they had to go daily because it would rot. There was a dependence, a, a reoccurring faith that was required. It wasn't once. Deuteronomy 8.3 says this, And he humbled you 
Moses comments, and he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. His intent is for you to walk by faith. That's not going to change. If you're uncomfortable with that, you're going to be uncomfortable with that because he's not going to change. This is who he is. He is perfectly comfortable with our dependence. And the sooner we trust that and we get that as a reoccurring thing, that's not going to be a one-time thing, that I had to trust him here. And therefore, I will never have to trust him again. I've proven my faith. That is not how it works. There's this just constant reoccurring trust. But by the way, that trust compels a relationship. It invites one at least. Trust is normal, and it's something's expected. So at this day, this specific day, life looks impossible for Philip. Jesus is there, and life still looks impossible. He's there. He's present. In fact, he's been doing things, and this request still seems crazy. How are you going to feed them is the question. The second thing I want you to see is 12 basket memories. Look at verses 8-10. through 10. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there is a boy here who, have, who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. Now, there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down, about 5,000 in number, and again, plus families. So Andrew, in my opinion, offers this lifeless idea, observation. There are thousands of people here, but we have this, this boy. Now, the boy, by the way, could be young adult, like the word can be used in various ways, but whatever the case is, it isn't much. We have five barley loaves, which is kind of a picture of, of not a wealthy person. It wasn't we. That would have been more common with a wealthier person. Five barley loaves, two fish. So the Boy Scouts here, no one else brought anything. Fact. <laughs> That's what's going on. And Andrew's lifeless, in my opinion, observation is this. This boy could, this, he has some things. That's not an idea. If you're there and this is your problem, if you've got to feed even 200 people, that's easier for your imagination. You know that you need space, trust me. You need food. This is thousands of people. A boy like this is not going to do anything. And Jesus' reply is, have everyone sit down. The place was large and grassy, it says. 10,000 people is, probably, is, a, is a pretty good guess of what's going on here. Look at verse 11. And Jesus then took the loaves... And when he'd given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish, as much as they wanted. You've seen that enough times, or probably heard about this enough times, that it doesn't even shock you. Um, I think of a time uh, in Ukraine, I know of a, a specific situation, where a Ukrainian church planter left um, his business, he was in business as his field, and he became a church planter, which... Financially, a little different. Uh, a businessman who was self-sustained and providing for his family, but God had called him to, to full-time church planting. And I remember hearing of this story. This person, he was describing uh, his concern for how his kids were going to continue to be in schools, where they were. And maybe the situation was going to be a lot different or harder for them. And he was just really concerned because, again, he had been a businessman, and now he's in this position where he's like, I don't know. Uh, and this was described in front of a person I know. And, and this person felt strongly that the Lord wanted his family to help. Now, what made it kind of interesting is this person really didn't have extra money either. This guy, this Ukrainian church pastor, is telling this story. And he talks about his family having this need. And this person doesn't have much himself, is feeling compelled, you should meet this need. But the person doesn't really have anything. It's kind of this situation. Philip, you need to feed him. And there's like, how are we going to do that? <laughs> Called, like compelled, you need to provide. But the Lord knew it was coming. Because that person was later called to relocate. So they sold their house. Money that didn't exist before showed up. And the money that was required was sent to that church planter. The story is really long, kind of interesting, actually. But it gets crazier because what happened later was God basically gave that person the money back. The person who provided for the church planter really just got the experience of watching God provide in two ways that were impossible. It's different, 
This is a miracle. It's meant to convey that Jesus really is Lord. Actually, He's Creator. Better said. But it's a good picture that He still does this kind of stuff. Look at verses 12-14. through 14. And when they had eaten their fill, He told His disciples, gather up the leftover fragments that nothing may be lost. Jesus wants them to remember, to carry and to physically see with for themselves that God is the one who took an impossible situation. This isn't anyone with any calculation skills whatsoever would understand that that was not done. My children, my youngest, Zoe would know, I don't think that's going to work then. You don't have enough money or food to feed for these people. Verse 13, so they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. And when the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, this indeed is the prophet who is to come into the world. So look at this again. Jesus looks at, took these loaves, he gives thanks, and he starts handing out. And the supply just doesn't run out. It just keeps showing up. He gave fish also. And it says, to the point until people didn't want any more, they were actually full. You know the difference between going to a place where the food's running low and you're like, I'm just going to eat a snack because I know it's not going to work. You know what I'm talking about? Versus the place where like, they're going, does anyone want any more? You know what I'm talking about? Hannah Moon is what I'm talking about. Does anyone want more? Take some with you. You're like, okay, okay, we're good. You know, this, this is eating until filled in a situation when it's just pure void. There's not enough food, and yet they're leaving full. They're like, I don't want any more. Take the leftovers. That's the situation. Here's what you need to make sure you see. This is an act of creation. On this day, several thousand years ago, God creates right there. He adds food that did not exist. The Son of God is on the planet. He's doing impossible stuff. Jesus knew what he was going to do, and he needed Philip to be at a loss and be like, I can't do anything about this. You're right, but he's going to do it. The people eat until they're full. They gather leftovers, feeling the weight of God's provision. And they conclude the anticipated prophet has come, but he's much more than a prophet. Moses talked about one who, this prophet who would come who's in his kind. And it doesn't mean he was just a prophet. It just means this one's coming. That's their conclusion. That's, that must be what it is. God's at work here. But Jesus is Lord of creation today, right now. Look at verse 15. Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. He's basically saying, I'm not that kind of king, not right now. They want him to deliver them from Rome. Deliver us from our oppression is their desire. And he's like, that's not what I'm doing, at least not right now. The third point I want you to see is as if dry ground. Look at verses 16 through 21. And when evening came, his disciples went down to the sea. They got into a boat and they started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. It's now nighttime. And they leave without Jesus. I think of Jesus a bit like those, you have a friend who you're like, oh, he'll be here. Like, when's he going to be here? I have no idea. But he'll be here. I really think that was who Jesus was. He just kind of did his thing. So they're like, leave. They're like, I don't know. We've got to go. <laughs> he'll find us. I really think that Jesus was like this. As I was reading this, I thought, you, you're like that. You're the friend that would frustrate me. You know, I like, you know, I talk about like, hey, meet me at such. It's like, I have no idea when they're coming. No, they're coming. I just don't know how or when. This is Jesus. It's nighttime. They leave without him. They're heading west on a boat back to Capernaum. And scripture says there's this strong wind that is blowing and the sea is rough. If you've ever been in a place where the sea is rough and the wind is blowing, that's where they are. We're at 19 through 20. And when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea. And coming near the boat, and they were frightened. But he said to them, it is I, do not be afraid. People who aren't Christians talk about walking on water. This is a story that's familiar. And if you're not shocked by it, you haven't seen it yet. I like what J.C. Ryle says. He walked on them as easily as we walk on dry land. They bore him as firmly as the pavement of the temple or the hills around Nazareth. 
even the land that you walk on right now and the air that you breathe right now is spoken. You tend to think that water is less sure than the ground. But I'm telling you, God made the ground and God made the water. And on this day, he said, the laws of my world that I spoke and that I created will uphold my feet while I walk. The same king who authored our world and faithfully upholds its laws day after day is walking on the water. This isn't some kind of cheap ploy. John wants you to know who he's telling you you can believe in. And while that doesn't fit your categories of normal, do not be so confused as to think that God can't do this. I I say it all the time. C.S. Lewis words, right? I have to do that, include in every one of my sermons, not really. You're welcome for those who are thinking that. Uh, If you entertain, if you say that God exists, you have no defense against miracles. That's what it comes down to. A self-existent being who caused this world into being can make water hold your feet. If that's hard for you to believe, then you don't have a big enough imagination about what a maximally great being is. This is light work for him. And he's meaning for us to see that the Savior who died for us is Lord of creation. He is sovereign over water. John 6, 21 says this, and then they were glad to take him into the boat. It gets crazier. Immediately the boat was at the land which they were going. I think a miracle happened again. Some would say maybe it it went there really quickly. Or the project is over or something. I think of the trauma of roller coasters. You know what I'm talking about? You ever been to King's Dominion, a fast roller coaster, and people come back and their face is, is flush, especially if they've never, like the fearful kind, you know what I'm talking about? The people who are, terror has reached their eyes. I think, I don't know, on this day, I think they saw God the Son doing some crazy stuff that's crazy only for me to do, but is honestly pretty expected for God. There's this trauma of the roller coaster. I think they felt. At Passover, think about these things. At Passover, the Lord delivered the people out of Egypt, an impossible situation. Jesus has come to deliver his people from their sins. The Lord parted the seed for Moses after Passover and then delivered his people through the water on dry land. Jesus walks on the sea as if it is dry land. And then he gets in the boat and immediately be on the other side. The Lord provided manna that was regularly collected by faith. Jesus miraculously feeds thousands of people. But more importantly, and we won't see this today, Jesus identifies himself as the bread from heaven, the bread of life. That Jesus, It's in Jesus that we have eternal life, and he satisfies our spiritual hunger. What are you thinking when you see this? John wrote this so that you would believe. Think again of what it would be to speak and to have authority over uh, creating food and walking on water. The same king who authored our world and faithfully upholds its laws day after day still calls his people, like you, to trust him. The people of Israel had to trust him for manna. Philip and Andrew had to trust him for food on this day. And the disciples, the church planter from Ukraine, And the family who provided had to trust this one. It wasn't just in chance. And maybe things will work out. I have just a great feeling about things. No, 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 no. This is in you trusting in God. He's calling you to do that. Have you ever entered a situation where you said, this is not going to happen and this is pretty much impossible? Not going to happen. I had a very mild version of this this week. Light. Prepare yourself to be underwhelmed. But it was still exciting. Uh, This week, I'd been praying for a guy uh, who comes in to the church and does maintenance every once in a while. And one point in time, I'd talk to him just about, you know, Christianity and stuff. And I, and it was obvious to me he'd been in, in the church. Not this church, but a church. And I was like, but one time I just kind of t- tried to talk to him about, you know, where do you go? And he was very, he was pretty clear. Okay, not interested. That's where we were the last time. 
This past week, he came, and I'd been praying for him. And, and I said, you know, it's, it's obvious to me, he did something that reminded me that clearly he'd been around church some. And I said, I'm just curious, is, is there a reason, did something happen that changed you? Like, what, what's the, you know, why, where are you? And he said, I don't really have a real good reason why I stopped. And I told him my story. So I was raised in the church. I basically said this. I was raised in the church, and my question was, is this true? Not does it work. Is this true? And I was reading an atheist in college who became a Christian. And this person was convinced enough that Christianity was true, that he abandoned his atheism, which he didn't want to do because it made him sick to think that it was true. And he became a Christian. So that was going on in my life. And I was going, no, I actually think I had reasons, intellectual reasons. I'll tell you about them sometime if you want, uh, for believing that Christianity is intellectually true. Lots of things. But then also internally, God was addressing me morally and showing me that I wasn't fine. And I knew I had guilt and I was uneasy about it. And so I saw that Jesus was both the Savior I needed and, and it was historically true. And I said, so I, you know, that, that's some of my story. Um, his reply, I was thinking it was going to be like, I said, <laughs> I'm done talking to you. He didn't say that. He said, keep working on me. This to me is a minor, very small version of what we're talking about. An impossible situation. A person who's just pretty hostile, who is like intrigued. I'll give you another one. My wife. I remember talking to her. She wasn't my wife at the time. Talking to her about Jesus. And at the time, feeling I was telling her the gospel. And I felt like I might as well have been talking to a concrete wall. It was just totally not effective. Just like, meh. And my prayer of monstrous faith, I've told you many times, some of you know me, was, well, Lord, if you don't do anything, this is never going to work. Jesus did things. He really did. He broke through, showed her who she was, showed her who he is, radically changed her life. You can ask her about that. But I remember what it felt like for an impossible situation. Not the same person. All of her friends would say so. And Jesus is the change. It wasn't neat things. It wasn't the right people. Jesus changed her. John has written these things that you and I might believe that Jesus is the Christ. And by believing that you would have life. That's the plan. He walked on water. That's hard for us to see, right? I think that as a kid, I think, let me try walking on the pool water. I had a pool in my backyard in, in Danville, Virginia. And that never worked. It really isn't when you think about it. When you think about authors and makers, it isn't even hard for him to walk on water. I don't know what he has for you. I'll close with a couple things. Non-Christian, what keeps you from Jesus? This Jesus saves souls. Sinners found him entirely um, who they wanted to be with. I would love to talk to you sometime about what it looks to trust Jesus. Christian, what is one place he's calling you to trust him? I'll close with J.C. Rowell's words. He says this, Let all true Christians take comfort in the thought that their Savior, listen to me, let all true Christians take comfort in the thought that their Savior is Lord of the waves and the winds, of storms and tempests, and can come to them in the darkest hour, walking upon the sea. There are waves of trouble far heavier than any on the lake of Galilee. There are days of darkness which test the faith of the holiest Christian. But let us never despair if Christ is our friend. Let's pray. Father, uh, Lord, I, I pray. Lord, I pray for those who don't know you. God, uh, John, you wanted John to write this. And these aren't normal for our thoughts. We can't do that. We can't walk on water. But that's silly to think that you couldn't make a law that would uphold your feet. That's silliness. Help us to see that you're a lot greater than we gave you credit for. You showed Philip and Andrew a situation that for their thoughts, their categories, it was too big. And then you did a miracle that displayed that you are the creator of bread. Lord, I pray that you would draw people to faith, that you'd do it again. That you'd do it again. I pray for 
believers. Lord, set people on fire for you. I pray that people would see how amazing it is that we have the opportunity to know the living God. That we, it would displace um, projects that really are unnecessary projects. Distractions from you. And that we'd come and remember actually this, that you are the bread of life. You're the, the food and the sustenance that we were made to be satisfied in. I pray that that would be the story of everyone who's here who and everyone who will ever see this sermon. In Jesus' name, amen.